My story of coming into renewal is like the story of so many people. It comes with reluctance, hesitancy, pride. And I just felt really privileged that God would give them that gift for them to pray over me at that time. I remember the next morning getting up out of bed and riding my push bike into town and something in me was so different. It's always just there and I know that I can trust. It was in Perth that he taught me about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There was a joy in my heart, a lightness in my spirit. I was singing songs that I didn't know existed. I bought a, a, a copy of the Bible because all I wanted to do was read the Word of God. Uh, a great surprise, I, I fell backwards into the, into the grace and love of a waiting father. Just tell us maybe a little bit about your own church background and how you ended up going to a Lutheran church. Um, I've been a Lutheran since birth. Um, grew up in a um, Lutheran church, baptised. Yes, we were um, both born into the Lutheran church. I was born and raised in the Anglican church. Probably fourth generation Lutheran. Born again 35 years ago. Andrew. Yeah, church background wasn't really a big part of life growing up. Grew up as a Lutheran in a, in a traditional Lutheran church down in Gatton. I met Latoya at high school and we sort of started dating. I'm very Lutheran. Um, daughter of a Lutheran pastor who is son of a Lutheran pastor. Baptised there, um, confirmed there at Peace Lutheran Church. Church was very important to her, so then as we sort of grew closer. Went to a Lutheran high school. I had to have a bit of a serious think about God and faith. Been as part of my dad's church my whole life. Went to Lutheran camps. No, no, no. I have. Yeah. Lutheran all your life. All my life. Been going to Lutheran churches every single, yeah. every single week, I suppose. And that's how I was brought up. Not every single, but you know. God has always been part of my life. It was uh, a learning experience. Particularly the Holy Spirit. Church was just simply a means of spending more time with Donna. So that yeah. was kind of exciting. And I thought, that's a good deal. I was raised in a Lutheran church. Oh, wow. Catholic. and went there religiously. I certainly wasn't looking for a relationship with Christ, but it happens, it develops. How did you end up in a Lutheran church? My mother's side is Lutheran. Uh, after 30 years of pastoring in another denomination, they're from New Guinea, I felt called to come to this particular Lutheran church. But then sort of got tired of the more traditional straight down the line sort of thing. And then I moved from Brisbane to Toowoomba. And my father's side is... Became a Lutheran 35 years ago. From 1800s. I went to an AOG church for just a very short time. Been a Lutheran all my life. Um, Mum and Dad have been members of Redeemer. I felt to come to Living Grace. We just looked for the local church, the one that was closest to our house. Always had an interest in the Pentecostal side of things. And I went to a girls Catholic school. But thought they were at opposite ends of the spectrum and they couldn't exist together. Not a good experience. We moved to Brisbane and then came here a few times and realised you've got Pentecostalism and Lutheran working really, really well together. So I never really wanted to see a brick church with a steep and a cross on it again. So we came here. We came here and we just loved it. Didn't know much about Lutheran theology then, but I've learned a lot since. And I've been here at the Lutheran Church ever since. What do you think about it? I'm signing on. <laughs> You're signing on. Mm. Hi, my name's David Filsel. I come from the congregation of Warrigal down in uh, Brighton and uh, Adelaide. I have an interesting background. I was lucky enough to be blessed uh, as a, a successful businessman. But like uh, most businessmen at the end of your career, the Lord humbles you. And uh, he took me on a journey which ended up in a very dark place. After that, uh, luckily he showed me the way back to, to my Lord. And uh, spiritually he uh, took me to an environment that, uh, have a guess, he humbled me again. A very good uh, um, church environment, felt very comfortable and loved, loved a lot. But there was something more that I missed. and. Uh, in that environment. I heard from a friend of mine about a, a guy called Edgar Mayer. Edgar 
it was talking about the Holy Spirit and in my time of life I felt there was still more to have. I was able to go to, about two years ago, to Salisbury Church where he was preaching and uh, that was perhaps the most significant uh, time in my life, sitting and hearing what he had to say. to understand this Edgar Mayer, so I researched him and so forth. And about two months ago, I ended up at his uh, uh, congregation in Toowoomba, sharing worship with him. That night when I came back, the uh, Holy Spirit came to me. And that was one of the most amazing experiences that I've ever had. Lutheran Renewal began really with my own personal renewal. I came to Toowoomba in 1996 and began ministry here. First year, you know, passed on pea plates. Um, I said at my installation service that I have no intention of changing anything. I'm just trying to learn how ministry is done. And I did that. And two beautiful congregations, we did the liturgy right. We did everything right like Lutheran pastor would serve. Um, but I was feeling empty. I was just feeling like I had no connection with God. When I was praying, I felt like I'm the only one saying anything. God didn't seem to respond. I, I found the Sunday services in the liturgy, for me, was dry. I never heard God talk back to me, never had a sense that I was guided by Him. Um, the traditional way of worship, uh, always saying the same words, that just didn't work for me. The script was the same, and. Uh, I couldn't really speak from my heart. Then I noticed it didn't really work for the majority of the congregation either because not only did I have no converts, I wasn't the only one, probably no pastor in Toowoomba had converts. I had a constant trickle of young families that left the church. But I wasn't happy with that. You know, I'm a young pastor and, you know, I'm preaching and I'm doing everything and no one comes to faith. And they were not offended with me or anything. They leave of no good reasons, except that they didn't really connect with God. They got bored with church. and So I was hungry. I got a bit desperate. And I, I, I prayed and said, God, if that's all there is to ministry, you can have it back. I can't, I can't face another 30 years of that. In the past, we already had Lutheran renewal. That was in the 70s, 80s, early 90s. So for a good 20 years, we had Lutheran renewal. I knew nothing about it. Uh, I found out by accident because I, someone gave me newsletters they published back then, national newsletters. I want to introduce you to a man. I want to start talking about the Lutheran renewal that began in the 70s. He's the pastor whom God used to start Lutheran renewal. I introduce you to Pastor Doug Kuhl. If you haven't ever heard anything about Lutheran renewal back then, I hardly knew anything about it. i just give you a glimpse. It began in the most unlikeliest place. 1970, the Lutheran Church of Australia calls this man to do street evangelism. A place called Jacob's Ladder. On the streets of Adelaide. It was a sort of a decrepit looking building. Back then, Vietnam War was on and lots of angry youth on the street. With a staircase starting up the street and going right up. Basically, his call was to get the wayward Lutheran youth and get them back into church. Two floors um, to the back of the building and then you entered into Jake's, as it was commonly called. He didn't quite know how to do that, but God did. Jake's was full of street people and um, dropouts. He began by reaching out to um, Ping Pong Parlour, Hindley Street. Runaways from home. And he just wants to talk to the one youth and just introduce himself. All that sort of thing. As he touches that youth, just to turn around and say hello, the spirit falls on him and this young man drops to the floor and he gets saved. You know, what was that? And he gets saved. And so for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, over the next few years, thousands of people got saved. To begin uh, upon and among Lutheran people uh, in South Australia, it was the most unlikeliest place 
and the most unlikeliest bunch of people, really. And I want to include myself in that. Um, now, I had an experience with the Holy Spirit um, before I came to Adelaide. I came to Adelaide um, carrying this experience of the Spirit of God before Jake's. But anyway, the reason why I'm, I'm talking about the unlikeliest place is, is that really this is how God moves. If we try to put God in a box, you know, and say God can only behave or can only act or can, can only move, you know, in the circumstances that, you know, are contained in our box of, of human expectations of this is how God is, this is how God moves. Well, we are not going to understand God's ways with man at all. I mean, as you go through the um, catalog of God moving upon men through the scriptures, uh, it, is all, it is mostly the unexpected. It really is. First, I thought, you know, if our church just went to contemporary worship, that would fix it. Things happen, become a bit more contemporary. But that wasn't the answer. That was just a different way of doing it. I really did not know what I was hungry for. But God is really nice. Hey, you know, He's really nice. And then God was kind to us. And, you know, He just, He probably saw me in heaven just like uh, after all that study and reading the book all that time, He still doesn't get anything. And so, like, He gave me a hand. He basically dropped a few things in my lap that I had no idea about. My wife, some of you know the story, she always wanted the gift of tongues, my wife. So I, I didn't. I was pretty clear I didn't want it, but I got it. And then at one prayer meeting, I, my mouth opens and I hadn't even, and words come out and it's not English, it's not German, it's nothing I know. I got the gift of tongues. And so God says, oh, deal with that, you know. And it's like, what can you do? Like, you don't want it, you got it. The gift is real. The Holy Spirit is real. Embrace it. It's a bit like God saying, hey, you're hungry for me, so deal with that. We had a service in 2003. We had a Lutheran guest preacher. Pastor Gimetis Desta Buba came. He was sanctioned by the official church office. Very interestingly, he's a Lutheran pastor from Ethiopia. They rang me whether we would have him. He was uh, in the United States at the time studying. Had a vacant spot for him. I had, I had no idea who he is. He is. Didn't expect anything different. And he came and did ministry all across the LCA. And people were falling down under the power of the Holy Spirit when we was praying for them. And we ended up more than a hundred Lutherans on the floor overcome by the Holy Spirit. Gimetris preached on the Saturday. He preached on the Sunday. And then Sunday night, we had a, an evening service. And he pre preached you know, you know, a fairly boring, normal, usual Lutheran sermon in 20 minutes. And at the end, he just said, anyone wants prayer, come forward. And one lady went forward for prayer, and it was a member of my wife's Bible study group, and she fell over. And I leaned to my wife and I said, uh, I, think, I think you better go up and see how Mary is. I, I think she's got a virus or something. She went up and stood next to her, and next thing you know, my wife fell on the ground, and I thought, wow, this is really catchy. Then a few other people went up for prayer, and they all started falling over. Some of them crumpled, some of them fell backwards, some of them fell onto their face. And five minutes later, when I opened my eyes, the whole of the sanctuary and the whole of the front of the church, it looked like a battlefield. There were bodies everywhere. Yeah, now I'm relaxed about it. And this had not happened in his ministry either before. But not when it happened, it's just like, deal with that. It was God sovereignly doing something. And we certainly, our congregation, got a touch of that. We had hundreds of people show up from all over the Darling Downs. And two-thirds of them came out. And then two-thirds of those, you know, more than 100 people ended up on the floor. And when that happens and you don't see it coming, it's another, you know, God, deal with that. Uh, well, I tried to deal with that. I said, God, where is that in the Bible? And it was in the Bible, you know. You preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified, but not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. That's 1 Corinthians 2. Uh, you mm -hmm. really helped us um, <clears throat> understand it maybe a little bit, the Pentecostal scene. Mm -hmm. It's not as, you know, we just have a label Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. It's not like that. It's no, very it's diversified. Mm -hmm. You helped us to negotiate a bit. And you sounded very Lutheran, actually. Yeah. We actually... You know, well, I think Luther was, you know, onto something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Luther was onto something. Yeah, a bit of a revival uh, itself. But he talked about divisiveness, even mm -hmm. in the Pentecostal church. Mm -hmm. And he even said half of the Pentecostals 
don't really like a laughing revival yeah, or Toronto. That's true. So, I mean, what hope have the Lutherans got? <laughs> Not even half the Pentecostal. No, you have like a lot that. of hope because you don't have the baggage. You know, that's, that's one refreshing thing about this conference. I don't have to deal with all the baggage the charismatic movement has accrued. No, we don't even know. You it. just so, oh, yeah. it's exciting. Like you can add Pentecost just to the pure <laughs> Lutheran <laughs> doctrine. It's just uh, it's. It is exciting. <laughs> I, I actually would agree. With it. But like, uh, wouldn't you agree? You know, it wasn't as easy <clears throat> for us. We, we got it, I think, theologically. Mm. I don't think anyone would contradict. But to actually get in was a bit hard. You know, we were a little bit <coughs> reluctant, wouldn't you say? At first, of course. At you're, first. Because you're thinking. Yeah, we're thinking. The Germans are thinking. They're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> what are they thinking about? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But at least I was hungry. It wasn't very mature. It wasn't very informed. It wasn't very theologically, you know, knowing about things. But I just knew that I wanted more of God, and God answered, "The hungry will get fed." The Holy Spirit is doing so many things in the Bible. It's a very exciting book, and then He, he started doing things in our church, and were we going to embrace it? That was the big question. Another one is, I mean, I'm totally tired. I I want to leave the meeting. Right, but I'm running it. So <laughs> I'm just so exhausted. I'm actually sort of pretty physically sick. And the last thing is we do is we just pray for people and then, then everyone can go home. And that's what I was looking for and that's where I was thinking. Oh, tell us about, you know, you driving our demons. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good in another country where nobody knows you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so and that, you can't understand the language. There was some confidence in, and I can just yell because they probably don't know what I'm saying. Yeah, and then people come forward and... Um, you know, three people fell to the floor. Never happened to me before. That was that was quite incredible to to be in that situation. I was first one. I thought he was dead. <laughs> it was obvious there was some demonic thing happening. And then the third one, the third one, I prayed f prayed for the lady. She fell to the floor, and because it's so new to me, I just take a bit of time to check it out. <laughs> yeah, the girl was. Very angry, shaking, and well, you know, what's there to do? You have to. Do you want to help her? It was, yeah, just yeah. yell at the demons. And uh, words come out of my mouth that I never, uh, they didn't go through here. Yeah. And, and so, in um, Jesus' name, and did they actually leave? Yeah, and then you could see how, how she calmed. And yeah, yeah that, was, yes. that was really awesome there. And I commanded something to depart, and it did. So, I drove out an unclean spirit by accident. <laughs> yeah, now it's funny. <laughs> but um, I never knew that I needed more of the Holy Spirit. Had no idea. Uh, not my upbringing, uh, nothing at all. Phone into the deep end. I know, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what better way to learn and grow than just... Yeah. You know, just, just do it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's Jesus doing it, so yeah. in his name, so yeah. he got to lead Being us. Being allowed, yeah. yeah, allowing him yeah. Um, to use me. Yeah. Yeah. For me personally, as a pastor, I was looking for God. And when finally God did something that I recognized that was him, I was not going to say no to him. And I was not going to say no to him, no matter what the cost. So this was not a carefully planned, strategic you know, manipulating the church into renewal. I was the pastor. I wanted more of Jesus. And so I, I, I was basically, you know, took the church along the journey. There were others like me, and we were learning new things and discovering. I couldn't believe it, I, and I was so happy about it. And yes, I'm guilty of that. I told the stories in my preaching, and I was so excited, you know, like, man, you know, the, the word is pretty simple. The Bible is not that complicated. Preach the kingdom, heal the sick, drive out the unclean spirits, raise the dead and all of that. You know, the Bible is pretty clear, but there's no faith for it because I've never seen it. I went to a meeting where a lady who was totally healed 
in a miracle. And suddenly I get a glimpse it exists and so I'm sharing that full of joy. She had a word of knowledge and she said there's a young girl down there who's not sure she's saved. And I knew the Holy Spirit was speaking right at me because I was so mm. uncomfortable. So I got up and went out that night and I just know that what happened to me was I was born again. And then I discover a strange reaction. Not everyone is happy with the testimonies. And not only are they not happy, they, are, they have a negative reaction to it. It shatters them. I said yes to the Holy Spirit's prompting. And after it happened, I was just on cloud nine for weeks. I knew that I was saved. Mm. And it was just, um, it just set me on a path. I had such a hunger for the word. Our church has come to think we have an understanding in our church. And when you listen to the language, it's really clear. We have an understanding that if you have testimonies and experience of God, it somehow makes your faith inferior. The word was like, it wasn't just dry words anymore. It was like it come alive and I couldn't get enough. I'd read the Bible, I'd try and get books to read. So, yeah, it had to happen and then I knew what had happened after it happened. Okay. So I prayed for Graham then and it, he didn't understand either, but 14 years later, the circumstances God led him into, he had the same experience. So if you have experiences of God and your relationship with God and you have these high points, the Holy Spirit moves, it's not as, it's not as tough and pure than just completely living by faith where we don't see and experience anything but still hang on. Does that make sense? Yeah, and Delmo certainly came home a different person that night and, uh, you know, I could see it straight away, but because I hadn't had that experience, I was very hesitant to embrace it myself and, um, you know, I just probably dug my heels and I said, well, you know, until God talks to me. Do you know, at its very core, faith is an experience. If, if you read our Lutheran confessions. Since I have a real live Lutheran right here, yeah. a German one at that, yeah. <laughs> I have a few questions. Um, Help me understand how it's possible to be such a student of Luther and theology <clears throat> and not expect experience when the, the word itself is constantly describing what experience we should have. I mean, what? Yes. How do you? I'm trying to process no, you guys. I'm, uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> I'm not, that is my biggest surprise as well. The entire Reformation was based on mm -hmm. the experience of Luther mm -hmm. that was terrified yeah, by the law exactly. and came into the experience of indescribable peace and joy. He said it was like entering through the gates of paradise. Yes. And he experienced the gospel and now it's, suddenly we no longer understand experience. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to... I'm, I'm trying to... What is going through a yeah. thorough scholar's head because it's not just Lutherans, it's, it's, it's yeah. theologians in general yeah. that like to be experts on certain people and movements and teachings, except God. Yeah. They're not experts on God, yeah. they're experts on Luther. Yes. Or Calvin or yeah. Wesley. Yeah. or. The church has always made the mistake that we think that faith is about intellectual knowledge. So faith is holding the truth without a relationship. I mean, how, where's that in the Bible? Faith is more than intellectually knowing something. Faith is beholding God. Faith is a relationship with God. It's just so much more of God that yeah. we knew about. We didn't, yeah. we didn't know about um, prophecy and word of wisdom, word of knowledge. It's sort of comforting as well to know that God's not just a big idea that you sort of do the right things and hope that he's on your side. It was sort of um, made to seem like just preaching the word, that was prophecy and mm. things like that. Yeah, yeah. But there's a spiritual side there's, um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. that we didn't understand, and yeah. 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 which we do now. The Holy Spirit is an exciting dimension of God. He's interacting and it's real and you can see what he's doing. I was putting away the uh, nativity scene for work. Like with 
gold dust, you can actually like see that there's something actually physically tangible about it. I did my back in and for uh, five months from January to May, I had quite a sore back and often days I would almost be limping or crawling around the office almost. For me personally, the Holy Spirit is my tutor and encourager. But when we went to the renewal conference in the May, um, I went up for prayer and very emotionless, no sensations, nothing. It's knowing that God's presence is there with you. No, no um, uh, feeling whatsoever really, but I, I went for prayer and I was prayed for, Edgar prayed for me, um, and I submitted to the Holy Spirit and fell on the floor. I've seen the Holy Spirit heal people. Experiencing the Holy Spirit is is just that. I've seen the Holy Spirit change people. And it actually does stir something up in your soul. This is a, a really silly story. From the time I was on the floor, I never had any pain. Very, very small and doesn't mean anything to anyone else other than me. I'd had pain for five months. Um, and from that time, I hadn't had, I haven't had any pain in my back. I had a microphone in one hand and a Bible in the other, and I was prophesying over the word over pastors and I realized that my page needed turning and I had no hands to do it and so I just kept reading and at the exact moment a real sign for me for the Holy Spirit's anointing of, of healing through the power of Jesus it supernaturally just turned over for me and and I didn't do it and that that to me was it's such a little thing and yet it meant so much in such a small thing in a way um, just back pain but uh, well, as many people will know, back pain can be very uncomfortable. I grew up in a very uh, traditional background and my parents were introduced to the Holy Spirit when I was a teenager, but I actually wasn't very interested. I didn't feel a need. He speaks the truth to me and he's the life of God in me. Then I went off to a group called Youth with a Mission and I saw some people who were speaking in tongues. Being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, it brings like a freedom to the service that if something needs to happen, people are open to let that happen. I knew about speaking in tongues, but I didn't really think that I ever wanted to have that gift. Or if the preaching suddenly um, feels led to dwell on something or press something harder, then that happens. It's not just sort of reading from the script, doing one thing after the other. Well, one day I was in the prayer room just by myself praying and praying and I said, Lord, I, I want to speak in tongues. This beautiful language came out and I just began singing in this language. During the worship at these services, you, you do feel a stirring. And the next minute I was on the, my back, on the floor, and I couldn't speak for maybe 20 minutes. I was just there. I felt the Lord's presence. Of God within you and... And that's where you can get your, your greatest revelations. That's where you feel most in tune with God. And it didn't make me feel more like a Christian, didn't make me feel uh, more safe, but what it did make me feel is more close to my Lord. A feeling of peace or a feeling of conviction or something like that, that, that God has given to you. Especially the worship as well, like there's just big space that um, Everything just opens up and you can worship the way you want to worship, um, and whether that means crying or laughing or dancing or whatever, um, as opposed to just stand up when told to sing the verses one after the other and then sit back down. It wasn't just explaining that someone may crumble to the floor. It was actually describing mission work. I was preaching, not with wise and persuasive words, just a simple gospel message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And then God backed it up with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And that's how you became Christian. That's how the church was created. And then when you go to Romans 15, the Apostle Paul summarizes his entire ministry, all of his mission journeys. This is how he did it. What God has done through me in bringing the Gentiles to the obedience to Christ by what I've said and done by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, that's a summary of how the Apostle Paul did mission work, preaching the gospel and then signs and wonders, the Holy Spirit backing up the word. Now, I was wondering, does this still work? <laughs> right? I was thinking, maybe what was in the past we can do again. You know, it's, we already had it. It didn't destroy the church. Maybe we just relaunched Lutheran Renewal. I learned that in the past they structured it very informally. It's a relational network. You can't sign up anywhere on the dotted line. 
it's just people making a commitment that they start relating to one another and working together. So in March 2015, Lutheran Renewal as a movement got started at Living Grace Lutheran Church in Toowoomba. We did that with the knowledge and blessing of friends, Lutheran friends across the LCA. And we established a national steering group, passes from different places, Canberra, Brisbane, Adelaide, Toowoomba. Because I didn't know a single pastor whose ministry could be summed up like that. Certainly my ministry, you know, no one would accuse me of preaching a simple gospel message and then things get backed up by the power of God's signs and wonders. I wasn't really well known for that and I didn't know anyone else. What we're doing is we uh, publish a Lutheran Renewal magazine, it's free of charge, to get the testimonies out, to get the stories out and to have articles that unpack a little bit about the Holy Spirit. We have national conferences now. Oh, the last one we had at Mount Barker, more than a thousand people turned up. That's only the second year. But there, there's a need to bring people together. You know, mm. Lutheran Renewal mm. existed already <coughs> beginning probably mm -hmm. 1970 into the 90s. Mm -hmm. And it touched a lot mm. of, uh, you know, Lutheran lives. Mm. But it came with a lot of conflict. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you know, you listen to the older ones, they got hurt. And some of the pain is still very raw. I would, you know, it's real. And it got squeezed out. Mm -hmm. You know, I had one bishop at a, a, you know, a commission of theology meeting. He said, oh, that sort of thing raises its head every 10 years. Yeah. And you know what he didn't say, but what, which I understood is, but every 10 years we shut it down. So, you know, this is now Lutheran Renewal new we uh, i guess step into the inheritance of the past <clears throat> but well, you know and we're always hopeful but how hopeful can we be that more of the church is going to embrace it and we have unity we still have the same issues the same issues have existed all through history you know when the holy spirit began touching people even back in luther's day <clears throat> People burned their Bibles. They made whole bonfires to yeah, burn yeah. their Bibles, and Luther got all, all upset. Yeah. <clears throat> we have the same issue today. You know, the tension between word and spirit. Yeah. Everybody says we need both, but how yeah. does it actually work? Yeah. You know, how does word and spirit actually yeah, yeah. work together? Yeah. Because the way we've grown up, our environment was you preach a sound sermon. You know, good exposition of the scriptures. You preach the best possible sermon. You get them in in the introduction. And, you know, you keep up the pace. And it's all awesome. And then you have an awesome conclusion. And, you know, this, this is it. And then people come to the Lord because, you know, this is how you preach. And it's all so well and done. But I didn't know anyone that sort of, you know, preached the gospel message. And then it got backed up by signs and wonders. And... So I was wondering, does it still work? And meetings in different places, you know, if a church wants to invite a team from Lutheran Renewal, we come, we teach on the Holy Spirit or whatever's on the cards and people are receiving. So we're working together and we, we probably, you know, see where the movement goes. It's early days, but it's a relational network. And um, I probably have to say, not everyone that is in Renewal right now in the LCA is part of Lutheran Renewal. It's not like Lutheran Renewal is generating or orchestrating doing that by human intention. I think Lutheran Renewal is just recognizing that right now the Lutheran Church of Australia is on God's agenda because quite independent from one another in all different pockets of the LCA, people are becoming hungry for more of God and, and God is answering their hunger. And so people independent from one another are discovering more of God and Lutheran Renewal is just trying to connect the dots. Midway through 2015 I had uh, gone to get some MRI scans the day that I injured my back. They found out that I had a uh, ruptured uh, disc in my spine and the L5 root nerve was pushing on my spinal cord and this was causing incredible pain. When I was in bed one day doped up on a, a, lot of, um, a lot of medication to help me with the pain. I could basically go to the doctor and get any medication that I wanted to. I remember laying in bed and just reading through scripture and reading about the ruler who came to Jesus and uh, wanted healing for his servant. And, and so I prayed, I prayed, Lord Jesus, you healed that person's servant just by simply speaking a word. 
and I know that you can do the same for me. And so I prayed that prayer. I said, Lord Jesus, you could simply speak a word and I'll be healed. But if it's your will that I continue in this pain, then I'm happy to do that. I knew that there was strength in weakness. To doctors who have said she had keratoconus, keratoconus which is a cornea disease, which means the cornea is spinning and with that vision goes. So everything in my left eye is a blur. I was a blur. A blur. <laughs> A little after this, I attended the 2015 First Lutheran Renewal Conference in Toowoomba. Tatiana prayed for me for healing, and I, I, I sensed a gentle healing come on in my back, and some pain was taken away. The doctors have said there's nothing that can be done. It's only going to get worse. But God is better than any doctors, because he has brought healing. And she can see. <laughs> she can see. Sciatica pain in my leg um, was starting to get removed. And I was so surprised I walked around the church uh, during a lunch break several times just to, just to feel if I could actually uh, sense the healing that was happening. And sure enough, it was happening. A little later in the day, Clark Taylor uh, was, was um, leading a session and praying for healing for people. And he called people that had back pain to come forward. I was kind of content with what God had already done for me. And so I guess in some, um, probably a bit of fear, but probably maybe some arrogance as well. I just firmly sat in my chair. I prayed, Lord, if you want me to come forward, then you really have to make this obvious and clear. And it wasn't until Edgar actually came down from the front, he started searching me out. He was looking for me and that, that freaked me out a little bit. But he eventually pointed at me and he said, Luke, come forward for, for healing. Pastor Clark Taylor laid hands on me, just praying for me. And in an instant, it was like a, a bolt of lightning went through my body and I fell to the floor and um, I just sensed this, this warmth and healing come over me and he prompted me to get up and to test my back out and sure enough, my back, back was healed. I think I was in shock for a couple of days, wondering if this, this had actually happened. I was a bit skeptical of Pastor Clark, but sure enough, there was healing and not only a physical healing, but I think God was healing my spirit as well. He was healing me of, um, a lot of people who experience severe sciatica pain, it's soul sucking. It not only makes you feel physical pain, but it, it, it pains your soul. So I received uh, a healing also in my spirit, a lifting of depression, a renewing in my call to be a pastor. And so that was an incredible blessing for me. You know, the miracle of gold dust, quite a few had it last night. You know that if you didn't have it last night, it, you're loved by God still. You know, I don't have to say it, but I say it anyway. And a lot of times, you know, I don't have it or my wife doesn't have it, but we know that we're loved. Jesus died for us all, so we just rejoice when he pours it out and, you know, in his wisdom, he picks the ones uh, on a particular time. But I, I do encourage you checking hands. And even last night, it came as we looked. So many times, it comes as you look. And I wonder, why is that God? And I think... Because looking is exercising faith. And you know, God responds to faith and God responds to hunger. You know, my mum, for years now, she gets it every day. And the reason why she gets it every day is she has her prayer time and her, her worship time, and then she goes to the window, puts her hand into the sun, and she doesn't move until she has it. <laughs> so, Jesus, please, you know, just uh, encourage her. My dad passed away so close to two years ago, so you know there's quite a bit of pain in her heart and stuff, and she just gets so much joy out of it. And um, and, and then another one is um, I love that one as well. Just a few weeks ago in Rockhampton, um, among the Lutherans there, the gold dust came as well. And you know when I asked them to to check their hands, no one did. Well, really, no one did. They were all interested in healing. So I couldn't really complain about a lack of faith. They all had a lot of faith, but you know, they had bigger things on their mind than gold does. I actually wanted to get up at Sizzler that night. I was having dinner and I, I wanted to just tell everyone in there that Jesus had actually healed me and I, ha I had had this experience and, and it was good. And so um, I, didn't, I didn't want to get kicked out of Sizzler. I actually thought of the, the woman at the well when Jesus told her everything about her and, and he said, don't say anything about this. And she went back to her village 
and she was actually the first evangelist in the New Testament. She went and told everyone. She just couldn't hold in the greatness of the gift that Jesus had given her, and so I, I sense that as well. But I think that God loves, because you know you have a whole church doing this. I mean, you look like kids. You know, all the education, all the status, all the you know, all everything. You're reduced to this, and I think God likes it. It's very humbling when you think about it, childlike. I'm Jenny Hager, and I first came into Renewal about 45, 50 years ago. I was in the Anglican Church. Like many in the Lutheran Church and other denominations, my life changed as the Holy Spirit began to bring renewal. And this was such a transition in our life, but difficult for the church that I was in at the time to understand. My husband and I felt that to be free, free in what God was calling us to do, we needed to leave the Anglican Church. And that was a great sadness to me because my uh, family for several generations had been priests and involved in the Anglican Church. But the Lord clearly said to us, follow me. Over the years, I've been sad when I've met Lutheran people who would have left the Lutheran church simply because God has called them to follow him and the church hasn't fully understood what was happening. 16, 18 years ago, I was at a large meeting in Adelaide, mostly Pentecostals in the entertainment center, hundreds of people there. And the Lord suddenly gave me a prophecy which I was invited to come out on the platform and share and it was that God was going to bring a great revival to the Lutheran Church. And at the time, most people didn't receive it. They didn't understand. They uh, saw the resistance of the uh, church to the Holy Spirit. But I have known for years that that was the plan of God. And so I'm so delighted to be at this conference here, to see the openness of people's hearts. And I believe that the day is coming when it's much easier for grassroots, in a way, to follow the law than for leaders who feel responsible uh, in, in making the decisions. Pastors, I'm a pastor uh, of, of a local church, and that responsibility does weigh heavily on leadership. So we're praying for leaders right across all of the dom denominations to really understand the power of God. It's time to become hungry. I, I certainly became hungry back then, but I didn't know for what. My hunger was a bit immature. I actually did not even know what I was hungry for. And like when you read the stories in the Bible, it's the same in the Bible. You know, they first come to Jesus because they want a healing or they, they come to Jesus because they heard about a miracle. They, they come for some sort of reason. But, you know, at least they're coming. At least some sort of hunger is getting them there. And when they come to Jesus, they discover that they, what they can get from Jesus is so much bigger than what they expected. You know, the Bible is exciting. Then there's so much. There's eternal life. There's forgiveness of sins. There's a life with God. I think that's the key for renewal. It's got to start with hunger. It's got to start with a holy dissatisfaction with what we have right now. If there's not a desire or a yearning to have more of God, uh, nothing will change. We don't want to be in a dying church. Do we? We want to be in a growing church. And we want more for our nation. I mean, the, the figures stagger me. A hundred years ago, what was the percentage of Christians in Australia? Staggering number. And now it's so small. We stayed in the Lutheran Church probably for the first 45 years of my life. We had an encounter with God and um, we just felt that we need, needed to go somewhere else where we could get fed more of the of the, the Word of God, things that weren't being offered in the Lutheran Church. It was at a stage where our kids were teenagers and we could see they were losing interest. And I, I was getting a little bit frustrated mm -hmm. too with what was going on. It just wasn't, wasn't getting deeper into God. It wasn't building that close relationship which I wanted to see. Things that the Lutheran Church didn't recognise as um, needing to be taught. My parents 
had done an, an Emmaus walk and um, the Holy Spirit had really spoken to them. So we started to look around and we ended up in the Assemblies of God. And so we would started sort of doing every second week going around to local churches that weren't Lutheran. As a family we started, uh, we were kind of church shopping but we, we, we sort of felt that we would stay faithful to the Lutheran Church in that we would actually go back and visit from time to time. For mum and dad I guess they'd sort of seen it, their teenagers and looking at the church going well there's more to God than this and we know that our kids are going to want to want more from God than what we've got at our um, at our church right now. We were very restless and we mm. were looking for something. Every second week we go to another charismatic Pentecostal. We found one or two churches that were really lively and quite open and friendly. And then the other week we'd go back to our home congregation for it was probably about two or three years. We were going all sorts of places, different places, mm -hmm. different churches. So you were on the move, you were basically leaving your traditional church, you were looking for more. Yeah. Um, what exactly were you looking for? Um, we didn't know what it looked like, I think we just needed more, we, we wanted more heart. I wanted to uh, come away from church. We had a great set of, like, lot of friends there, but the relationship with God wasn't, um, we didn't look like what we thought it would look like. Feeling like I wanted to stand up and give a standing ovation. And we didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit, even though it seemed to be a really vital part. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't happening when I was leaving church. Kind of is a really vital part. It was like, oh, that was pretty much the same while I was reading the liturgy. Looking at our Lutheran Church of Australia right now. And I wasn't actually being engaging with what was being done or said. The official church publication in one 18 year period we lost more than 30% of attending members. And I needed a freedom to be able to emote and clap when I wanted to clap, if I wanted to clap, and just weep when I wanted to weep. More than a 30% decline of people actually turning up on Sunday. So we are not in good shape. We had been involved since being married, involved with a traditional Lutheran church, and mm. this was quite open and quite refreshing. They're looking for that more in life. What is going on with the Lutheran church? It's really timely and appropriate. What is it that we're doing? Your sort of sermons really gave, to particularly me, an insight into um, what uh, the Bible was really telling us and um, what the Holy Spirit meant. For me, Lutheran renewal is about relationship with our Father God through Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. I remember walking to my very first non-Lutheran church and realising that people were generally excited to be there. I'd never experienced that growing up in a traditional church, that people were genuinely excited. Rather than the traditional, every Sunday, the same thing, the same thing. And unfortunately for me, and rather sadly, I see the Lutheran church bound up in religion, not relationship. There is something about the traditions that maybe it's just a nostalgic thing but the church has dwindled i see the the evidence and the effect of that in the diminishing numbers of people calling themselves lutheran since the re the union of the two churches in 66 in 66 that's 50 years ago in the last census there were 75,000 fewer Australians identified as Lutheran. I, I believe it's dying and unless there is renewal within the church, it's going to die. Yeah. I, I like how we have Holy Communion as often as we can and yeah. you know we light those Advent candles and all that sort of stuff that, that really meant something um, back when I was, was younger. I have had to go outside of the Lutheran church to actually experience God. And our worshipping numbers are now well under 30,000 people. They must have life and vigour and the spirit. You've been travelling and you know you've been praying for Lutherans across the nation. I'm overwhelmed, there's so many here. Adelaide and Victor Harbour. How, how do you find the ministry? Is it difficult or is it easy? Do Lutherans receive easily? You know, are there open doors? A big welcome to all of those who have travelled so far. Some, not all. I think the, the ones that aren't, I think they're fearful. If there is a wholehearted renewal... They're structured, everything's in place and everything's comfortable. I just think 
how wonderful our church could be, how powerful it could be. And it's difficult. Mm. It's difficult mm. to open your heart. Because it's not us, it's the Holy Spirit that is working. To say, I'm going to try this out, I want to see what this is all about. In the Lutheran Church of Australia, we struggle with experience. We think faith is more, you know, you mental assent, believing certain doctrines, following certain traditions, being convinced of our rightness. I was out of church. I didn't like being out of church. I told the Lord this. I would almost say that um, renewal is essential. Because I live in the world with worldly people, seven days a week. Not only in the Lutheran church, but in all the mainline churches. And church was like heaven to me to run to. For me, it, it's really um, uh, taking that, that whole aspect of the, the religious formalities out of, out of our faith. We pulled into Living Grace Lutheran Community Church. We're dealing with a personal God. And God said, this is your church. How did God say that? How did you Just know? Just like I said it to you, this yeah. is your church. Were there thoughts in your head? No, audible. Audible. This is your church. Because if you look at the, the demographic in the churches... I had no idea what a Lutheran church was. There are no young people coming into the, most of the churches anymore. And yeah. There's no, nothing there to attract them. What's a Lutheran church? Where the Holy Spirit's moving, where the Holy Spirit's given freedom, the young people are there. My husband, Don, I said, what are they? He said, one of your mob. It's, it's essential, otherwise we're going to lose a whole generation yes. of people who won't know the Lord. <laughs> They're one of you meaning a Christian. It's encouraging faith in others. It was very different. I'd love to see that for everyone. I wasn't sure what I was doing there. I'd mm -hmm. love to see people connect with Jesus yeah. and to have their faith liven up. And he spoke the Psalms and did sang the Psalms and it was very beautiful. Mm. I hadn't heard that before. I love tradition. Christmas time's an awesome thing. Very godly. Mm. Mm. But not tradition for tradition's sake. We took years to pioneer. I took years to learn. We've got to allow God. It was such a slow journey. Having a liberty to be able to just mm. experience God in the way that he wants to touch you. I saw the power of God before I knew God. Whether it's through laughter, whether it's through tears, whether it's just through pensive moments. To know that the Holy Spirit is still handing out his gifts. He still yeah. wants people yeah. empowered. But you didn't yes. know all, all that much about Jesus no. or the Bible. No, I saw first. Oh, yeah. And God showed me things. He still wants yeah. people mm. praying for each other and yeah. caring for each other. But I had no foundation in the Word. In my estimate, it's actually the Lutheran Church of Australia, the way I've grown up in it, is not as Lutheran as we think we are. We've actually moved away from the foundations. You were very prophetic. You hear God audibly on occasion. You saw people being healed. Luther knew what it mean, meant to be born again. People falling on the floor under yeah. the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's given freedom to move, a gift to the Spirit of welcome in the church. Luther knew what it meant to have Jesus Christ alive in our... He knew spiritual warfare. It's a bit different to the Lutheran church we grew up in. Yeah. With the rituals and the, everything the same every week. You know, Lutherans, uh, certainly that wrote the Lutheran Confessions, knew that a relationship with Jesus you cannot have unless you have an experience of God. That's what I want to see throughout the whole Lutheran church. Yeah. Is, it's not mm. so much the stiff formal, and I don't, I'm mm. not against that. If people mm. like to worship that way and have faith, that's fine. Mm. But, but They've got to bring in that whole personal side of it, that, that Holy Spirit that's actually touching mm. people's hearts. But you didn't have the foundation of knowing where that is in the Word of God? No, no. I did not. And so the Word has become precious for you now? Very precious. Uh, and there's just so much love in the church, it's just great. We haven't experienced that for such a long time. Yeah. To be in touch with that again and the freedom that comes with that and the outworkings yeah. of the Holy Spirit. And what I learned in the Lutheran Church. It's what we've been looking for. The Lutheran Church did that. Here at Living Grace. Then the Holy Spirit, he wants to be here and, and manifest himself because to show people what is available. So, yeah. and I think yeah. that's exciting to watch. I didn't really have anyone that was talking me through it, but I was reading books in the Bible and our confessions from a mainline traditional background. Mm. Did you find it easy to embrace more of the Holy Spirit? 
for how was it for you? Oh, it was challenging because denominational structures are not usually supportive of uh, people who move in uh, in renewal. And we loved the Lutheran Church, you know, we, we had a good solid grounding in the Word of God. But you persevere and uh, you don't, don't let them put you off. But it just didn't quite meet all of our requirements when we were born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. We, we knew that we needed we needed more. There's much, much more yeah. to what we were taught. But it's a struggle everywhere. The renewal movement in the Uniting Church used to work with the renewal movement in the Anglican Church. So we hung out together and did things together. Yeah. And they suffered, experienced exactly the same challenges. If you come from a Pentecostal charismatic background and you're in a Lutheran church that's so it's part of Lutheran renewal, uh, does, does that push your buttons as well? Are you excited about Lutheran renewal? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We're excited that the Holy Spirit is free to move. In t terms of Lutheran renewal in the Greater Australia, obviously people are looking for more. They're looking for something deeper with God. Yeah, I love and I still love the liturgy, but if it's just rote. And I think that's where a lot of people are at. They're yeah. looking for something yeah. more. If it's not sung and, and um, done with spirit and life, it's... It's lifeless, and that's what I've found within the church. I probably want to say that I guess I've done a fair bit of study but I've discovered that the whole journey into more of the Holy Spirit did not take one iota away from the Lutheran doctrines that I've come to treasure and appreciate. Many of the new songs that we are singing have, have so much joy, they have life and vigour. We've had this fantastic conference, the joy and the, the speakers have been fantastic, but where to now? And I know I'm a dinky die Lutheran. I, I love our Lutheran confessions. I'm reading our Lutheran confessions. I'm reading Luther. Christianity is all about a set of principles and uh, just believing certain things. And I say to them, it's actually more than that. It's actually a relationship. We needed a place in the Lutheran Church where we could connect and just share stories and share experiences. The emphasis is on having a relationship with Christ and we know in um, John 17 verse 3 it talks about eternal life. And uh, be accepted by one another. I think we need to need to show a lot of discernment. We need to gather together and we, we, we need to say what do you want us to do, Lord? You can say things and it's actually okay. You can share great testimonies and people get excited about that. And then unite together to take uh, what he wants us to do forward and, and not be locked back into our, our, our ways of, of individual thoughts and individual congregations and not becoming an island, becoming one church. Whereas if you do that in the church, there is this... Um, there is fear and there's maybe a rejection. Well, we've been to two Lutheran Renewal conferences and the first one we just didn't know what to expect. Yeah. And when we saw 300 plus people just worship God in the same way that we've enjoyed, mm. we were blown away, weren't we? To, you know, we just couldn't believe it. How hopeful are you that more of the church could come into renewal? That's what's exciting. Yeah. Is a possibility. Yeah, it would have to be a move of God, hey. We Absolutely. Just can't can't do it in the natural. Ourselves. Um, <laughs> but I think we saw at the conference that more than a thousand people attended. Yeah. So God did bring them. Yeah. He couldn't really advertise no. greatly. And to explore God, uh, God together. <laughs> Embrace everybody. Our bishops 
uh, pastors take the joy on and make Australia um, experience that again. I, I didn't know what to expect with the first one. It was amazing the number of people that turned up. Their whole life is transformed because they're trusting enough to come forward for prayer. And since then, um, I'm a different person. With faith and expectation. Um, even my children think I'm different, which is quite amazing. And they're receiving something of God. They get filled with the Holy Spirit and they come into something in God that is totally new to them. I just hope that I can, I can spread the joy and He can use me to do things which He wants me to do. It's more about Him and less about me. Uh, that's pretty hard coming from a guy like me, but that's the way it is. There was a Holy Spirit conference in Victor Harbour which um, Edgar and Tatiana Mayer and team from Toowoomba came uh, and facilitated. And I was really um, touched by the Holy Spirit at that conference. And um, I received uh, from their impartation. Uh, and the fruit of that's been preaching no longer is a burden. In the negative sense of the word burden, preaching is actually in the positive sense of the word burden, a fantastic, just free-flowing thing I'm not saying I don't prepare anything, you know, it's always good to have a few notes, a few dot points, but uh, for me it, it's just um, been be a step into um, more of the reality of um, Jesus Christ crucified from mere intellectualism to a lived expression. Are we going to lose our biblical foundations? Will we lose our Lutheran heritage? Will we become weird and, you know, all those fears? And like when we first began, I wasn't talking from a place of experience and saying, I couldn't say to the church, oh, I've been there before, I know it's going to be right. Church leaders and other pastors have been saying the opposite. They've been warning against things of the Holy Spirit. Instead of encouraging, they, they, they were more stirring up fear and we paid a price for it. In terms of um, speaking to our bishops and pastors. We did have a chance recently, Mark in New Zealand. I would say, that we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. I guess just a encouragement or a request from those in leadership. What he's speaking to us. Sometimes people don't really understand what's going on or they hear rumours or they hear this or that. Open your hearts up to sit around the table and talk to us. My exhortation is to look at the people's lives. One on one, you know, many of us. That the fruit of the experience of the Holy Spirit. It's not hard, it won't be hard. The fruit of renew renewal is that people love Jesus and love other people, that they want to be obedient to him, that they want to hear his voice. He's knocking, open the door and let him come in. The challenge is if they come from a place where they don't really know about the Holy Spirit and they're not open to it, where can they go? That feeling of fear of not knowing what it was about and what was ahead of them was a big point in their confusion. And that's a, a real challenge, has been in the past. Where do people go that know that there's more of the Holy Spirit, but in their home congregations there's no openness for it? It was greatly affected by the thoughts of the Lutheran Church in general, had a big bearing on how some of these people reacted. Everyone that's watching the videos, church leaders as well, bishops, what we need for Lutheran renewal to be a positive influence in the Lutheran Church of Australia is that there's an acceptance of it. I think the important thing is to realise that God is a creative God. So if people come, if the youth go to a Christian life week camp and they come home renewed and they've come something into something in the Holy Spirit, let's not talk out of them, let's not quench them, but give them a place, a, a place of expression of spiritual gifts. If we try and put him in a box in one way or the other, if you follow this formula, you get to God, or if you follow this formula, they get to God. God is so much bigger than that. Because they're hungry for God. You know, your parishioners, church members, they're hungry for God. People express worship differently, just like people express life differently. They want to go to church. They want to have more of Jesus. And we've got to be a church where there is, there's a welcoming of that. A safe place for that. Some people are really passionate, some people are really quiet and it's all okay, it's all part of the mix, it's all part of the body of Christ. Not everyone may want that, not everyone wants to have 
you know, go into the Holy Spirit stream, but surely there's place for everyone in the Lutheran Church of Australia. You know, we have traditional worship and contemporary worship, and maybe there's place also for uh, a stream that is exploring more of the Holy Spirit, and we can all be together in unity, and we find ways of pastoring and ministering to everyone according to their need. And I really believe that Lutheran Renewal and the traditional Lutheran Church can be alongside of each other. We are one in Jesus Christ. Rather than against each other. You know, Lutheran Renewal, I know I'm Lutheran. I don't want to leave the church. I want to be part of the Lutheran Church of Australia. I think they can actually work well together and trust one another and realise that if you want to be a Lutheran that wor worships in a traditional way, absolutely you go for it but if you want to be a lutheran that worships in a charismatic lutheran renewal way absolutely go for it and i rejoice in, in in our heritage this is my family be aware of what the holy spirit is saying to the church i know they do represent a big group of lutheran people and so they respect their thoughts as well mm. um worshiping in that in that traditional way and there is more than what the church already has. And I think sometimes the bishop's hands may be tied. It's really, really painful when you receive judgment. It's really, really difficult when you are trying to develop a loving relationship with our Lord and to have other people judge some outward manifestation. You know, you, you're in a position of leadership. Please leave aside people's judgments. Come and speak with us with the eyes to say, do these people love Jesus? Are they following after him? Are they searching after him? Are they loving others? Are they seeking the lost sheep? Lutheran Renewal now, connecting with Lutherans across the nation, I think we are doing that for others. And my experience from Lutheran Renewal is, yes, in general, people are. Pastors, we, we can just visit places and say, you're going to be okay. It's new territory for you, but God is God. And, you can trust Jesus and there's help and wise counsel and discernment available for you. Yeah, it is kind of heartbreaking when you want to do that and you feel like you're being challenged or judged and it becomes very discouraging. And it, to be honest, it makes you think, do I have a place? Do I have a place in my church? Is this my family? Is my family going to accept my love for God and my journey towards him. You know, when we first came into it, I was so keen that we would not miss out on the Holy Spirit. And then new people were coming into the church, not Lutherans, but Pentecostals, and they were operating in spiritual gifts like speaking in tongues. I think uh, that it has to be different because uh, I think that the church is on a hiding to nothing unless it actually embraces what the Spirit is doing. Interpreting tongues and saying words of prophecy in the church and doing all sorts of stuff. And I was so keen not to quench the Holy Spirit that I gave them space for expression in the church. Is that your experience from other denominations? Yeah, and many times, yeah. yeah. Weeping in church, that's okay, that's the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that you lose your foundations. So you've known renew movements in the past? I do, and when the renewal movement doesn't get supported by the denomination, uh, that denomination does its bit for uh, uh, church growth because they grow other denominations with the, with the members that no longer come to their church. If it doesn't get uh, accepted, if people keep pushing back, uh, we will lose quite a number of people who are hungry for that sort of ministry who will find another place to go to. Things have a way of creeping into the church and they carry on through the church for many, many, many years. The Lutheran Church was founded on the First Reformation. Sometimes we get to a point where we, we, we start to think these things have to always be in the church. We, we get um, habits. And in a sense, the Lutheran Church has created an idol out of that First Reformation. And we, we think they always have to be there. but we've treasured the treasure. Spiritually, things have been placed in the church over many years and it really opened my eyes as to why the Lutheran Church is as we are now. I would encourage them to, to, to just be open. And in doing so, we've taken our eyes off Jesus and what he's saying to us now. Denominational spirits, and it's not just in the Lutheran Church, it's every denomination. 
um, and those things bind. To just come along, to just experience what, uh, what God has for, for all of us. What do you think the best approach would be for the pastors? Because there'd be some that are really fearful and against. What would you advise them? That there's so much more to explore and it's actually exciting. There's nothing to be afraid of. If I had the opportunity to speak to the bishops and others in leadership, I would say... Once the church is fully free, God can really act in there. He can place his blessing on it and things can really happen. Yeah. Yeah, and people can live free lives. Don't stymie it, but support it and get behind it. Even the beginning, I was a bit uncomfortable. I wasn't quite at peace. I was not mature enough to shut down some things that were maybe a little bit weird, if that makes sense. That was just inexperience, immaturity. Now, you know, I still want to give the Holy Spirit free reign, but I'm far more confident now to shut something down in a worship service where I think it's uh, going off. It's the wrong prophetic word. You know, I'm, I'm quite confident now to say, oh, we're not receiving this word, you know, in a nice way. Um, if someone starts, for instance, shaking, you know, somewhere in the pews really violently and making people all uncomfortable around it, and I'm having a look at the person and not know the background of the person, and I think that person doesn't need to shake. There's no need for that. I, I shut it down. Other people may not, but I do, because I really want, I want to make the church a safe place. And if the manifestation is not needed but it's distracting, um, I don't give it the platform. So we would have benefited from mature leaders come in and just have a word of encouragement. And I guess Lutheran Renewal is wanting to provide that. And it did break up even my own family who didn't agree. And they still don't agree. But that's okay. We've learned, to, we've reconciled and learned to love each other despite okay. that. If a bishop had come and had just said, it's okay, it's the Holy Spirit, you don't have to be fearful. Mm. Or if Lutheran Renewal had been Yes. in place and other pastors from other parts of Australia would have visited us Lutherans and said yes it's okay yes you don't have to be fearful you're not going to lose the Bible you're not going to mm. it's not going to be weird and crazy not going to fall out of favor it, with not God a, it's not yeah exactly mm. that could have made a huge change and it's not blaming them it was no. just new for everyone it was new for everyone um, just ask the Holy Spirit to reveal himself to you you should look look into it more mm. not not just try and cut it off because it is outside the, the denominational doctrinal comfort zone, but check out what it's about. Let him show you the truth because he, he so dearly wants to see people saved and come to a complete knowledge of the truth. Read the Bible. <laughs> Read the Bible. <laughs> it happens in the Bible. <laughs> yeah. Casting out demons. It's all raising the dead. Don't put the walls up, you know, um, just allow the Holy Spirit to speak into your heart, let him lead you and follow him whenever he prompts you. We need to be um, in, in contemporary relationship with our society. We all are growing in our faith. We can't be buried underneath and not know what we're doing. The Bible says if you ask for a, a, a piece of bread, will he give you a stone? And it's exactly that. Yeah. You know, the Holy Spirit won't take you somewhere that's an ungodly place or an ungodly teaching. Allow him to lead you, allow him to minister to you. I'm a Lutheran, I know I am. Um, doctrinally, this is my heritage, but I also know I belong to the wider body of Christ. Jesus is for all believers and he talks so much in the Bible about unity. I love all the streams. I love the Pentecostals. I love the Anglicans. Uh, Salvation Army. I got friends everywhere. And I'm learning from people from all streams everywhere. I'm receiving Lutheran renewal. Our heart is to mix and mingle with the wider body of Christ. Because wherever we are placed, our immediate neighbours are Christians from other denominations. And we've got to work together to bring transformation. And I believe the Lutheran Church can actually be in harmony. Revival, renewal and outpouring, you know, people coming to faith in our cities and towns where we live. And if we can have permission to do that, I think the Lutheran Church will move on ahead. I'm optimistic, I think. I think with the right goodwill from people and leadership. And we've got to work together with other Christians there. And from brother ministers who are uh, willing to be open-minded. And we Lutherans got something to offer. And we got something to receive from the others. Lutheran renewal will have a brilliant future. So, yeah, Lutheran renewal, yes, there's a Lutheran heart of it, but it's for the wider church. 
and it's exciting to be part of that. All through the church, my hope is that this will bring unity. It'll bring joy when we go to church. We want to go to church. We want to be 24 seven working for him, not just on Sundays for an hour. We want to spread the gospel. We want to do it together. Our essentials are all the same. We all love our Christ, but we get so locked into non-essentials, whether it be women's ordination, renewal, whether it be whether we have baptism this way or that way, whether we go in the swimming pool or not, does it really matter? No, let's enjoy him and let's uh, spread the message out there. You know, glory be to God. My yearning is we have a culture that changes. When we meet together, we know we are among friends and we are encouraged. And when we talk theology to one another and our experience and we're sharing and debriefing, we're actually listening to one another and we value our brothers and sisters and we value their wisdom and their insight and together in unity we come to maturity. When I first met Edgar, the overwhelming impression about him was that he was a humble man of God. We live in an environment where we are in a declining church. We need change, we need initiatives. I really believe we're at a crossroads in our church and it's not women's ordination where we're at the crossroads. Encourage one another to give it a go, to try something you know, to cheer each other on. And I see him and his life mission as trying to unwrap the inheritance that our Father God has for us. We give it a go. And you know, if something doesn't work out, it's okay. We love one another and we can support one another. How, how good would it be if, you know, we, we're just brimming with ideas. I actually heard one pastor say to me that he loved the people that, that had come out of the Lutheran Renewal Movement because they're great members to have in your church. If people don't want to come along on Lutheran Renewal, that's okay. Because they just have a servant heart, they have a hunger for the Word of God. But let's not stop, hinder and control those people that do. I think, um, yeah, gives me faith to look for something more. Let's let go of those things that are constricting, that are controlling. They're excited about prayer. They're excited about going out and sharing the gospel. There are man-made traditions. People don't even understand why we're doing them. That's something, as a pastor myself, I, I want everyone to experience the renewing that comes through the spirit. You've got to grow. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to move forward. Let God have the glory for this because it's his church. That inheritance is for us now. It's not something after we die, but our Father God has this wonderful lot of treasure for us to unwrap and to step into. And the time to do that is now. The Holy Spirit is loving. He's, he desires us more than we desire Him. He wants us to be saved. He wants us in a relationship with Him. And right now, we are on his agenda. And um, I'm so hopeful for what God will do in the Lutheran Church. Right now, we live in a culture of fear. When anyone tries something new, someone gets up and gets mad, whatever. And so we don't try anything new because we don't want to be in the bad books. We don't want to get in trouble. God has a plan for us and we can step out in faith and try something that we haven't tried before. There's just so much more that God wants to do yeah. in us and yeah. in his people. Jesus is our Lord, he loves us, he's going to be safe. We keep each other safe. Revelation of Jesus is not possible to our own human intellect. We don't get to Jesus by our own human good works. Something got to happen to us where Jesus reveals himself to us and we're saying yes to him. It has a positive message for the church. It's a message of hope and joy. 
It's not taking anything away of the church, but offering something that we've been lacking.